All right, the War Vortex here. Today I'm going to be looking at Zeros and Ones by Sadie Plant, which is a book I finished recently. What I'm going to do is just write, uh, read about 45 minutes from it and then just give like a little summarization. I'm going to do the reading to give people watching an idea of um, what it looks like. So without further ado, I'll give a brief overview as well. So basically, um, Zeros and One is about the role of women in the uh, how that, the role of women in how, how that's how they've helped form um, computer science the development of computer science from the beginning of computer science being a uh, a science I suppose so it explores Ada Lovelace uh, its contributions well innovation really not contribution innovation of the Babbage analytical engine and explores just basically a lot of history that is not so well known I suppose. So I'm going to read probably just half this chapter which is called Mona Lisa Overdrive which is um, relates as well because I think William Gibson of uh, Neuromancer fame has a uh, recommends this book. Anyway, let's get on with it. Mona Lisa Overdrive and Mona Lisa Overdrive is one of his books. You Mona, that's you. She looked at the face of the mirror and tried on that famous smile. At the end of the 20th century, all notions of artistic uh, genius, authorital, or for, or for all in authority, originality and creativity became matters of software engineering. Beats extract themselves from melody. Narrative collapses into the cycles and circuits of non-linear text. Processed words, sampled music and digital images repeat the patterns of interlacing threads, the, the rhymes and speeds of gathering intelligence. Retrospectively, from behind the backlit screens, it suddenly seems that even the images most treasured for their God-keeping genius were given themselves matters of careful composition and technical skill. The Mona Lisa's appeal is precisely the fact that the image does more than passively hang on the gallery wall. As the spectators always say, Mona Lisa looks at them as much, if not more than, they can look at her. To the extent that it works so well, Leonardo's picture is a piece of careful software engineering. An interactive machine has been camouflaged to a work of Western art. Freud takes her as the image of womanhood. The figure in the painting is the most perfect representation of contrasts which dominate the erotic life of women. Women. The contrast between reserve and seduction, and between the most devoted tenderness and the sensuality that is ruthlessly demanding, consuming men as if they were alien beings. He quotes Murphy on this famous duplicity. What happens to cast a spell on the spectator is the demonic image of the smile. Hundreds of poets and authors have written about this woman, who now appears to smile at us so seductively and now to stare so coldly with a, without soul into space. And no one has solved the riddle of her smile, no one has read the meaning of her thoughts. Everything, even the landscape, is mysteriously dreamlike and seems to be trembling in a kind of sultry sensuality. They gaze at her in rapture and then in fear. At her first mention, she is a veiled courtesan. To 18th century European man, she is divine. Say Sard's very essence of femininity, and Bonaparte's madame, a sphinx of the Occident. By the early 20th century, she is both tre uh, treacherous, treacherously and deliciously a woman, according to E.M. Foss Forster, with the smile of a woman who has dined off her husband in Lawrence Durrell's word. Either way, the painting has produced the most powerful and confusing effect on whoever looks at it. Whatever they see, she returns their gaze. Perhaps they are returning hers. Like no image, she catches their eye. They cannot help but be taken with her. The Mona Lisa was painted by Leonardo da Vinci in 16th century Florence and composed as a portrait of uh, Lisa, Lisa del uh, Gigondo, a merchant's wife. There are a few holes in this story and sometimes suggestion the image was really a self-portrait or superimposed with Leonardo's mother's smile, but the standard history of the painting is supposed to be a straightforward affair. By the same token, the origins of the piece are extremely obscure. The painting is untitled and dated and signed, absenting itself from all connection with its source. There are no records of its progress or completion, no preliminary sketches, no entries in Leonardo's di diaries of his work, and no reference to his authorship until some years after his death. Even the setting is unfamiliar and strangely out of step with time. Mona Lisa sits before an anonymous landscape which hints that human activities once took place in this awesome terrain but were terminated at some point. 
and if uh, Vazuyan is right and the painting it really is a portrait of Lisa del Giacondo, it is a curiously lacking in contemporary detail. The dress is unusually plain for a gentleman does not seem to conform with current fashion. The hair is not artfully styled. There is not a single piece of jewellery which could denote wealth or social position. She was 16 and sinless, Mona, and this older trick had sold, uh, told her once that once that that was a song, 16 and sinless, meant she hadn't been assigned a sin when she was born, a single identification number so she'd grown up on the outside of most official systems. She knew, knew it, was po uh, she, it was supposed to be possible to get a sin if you didn't have one, but it stood to reason you'd have to go into a building somewhere and talk to a suit, and that was a long way from Mona's idea of a good time or even normal behaviour. William Gibson, Mona Lisa Overdrive. God given inspiration imagination creativity. Mona Lisa cares for none of this. Her effectivity is a simpler question of technical skill. As one of Leonardo's biographers points out, from the start he witnessed the harnessing of artistry to skilled engineering, and it is widely noised to be Sofumoto, uh, which gives the painting its outstanding sense of movement, shade and relief. These effects are produced by the application of many glazes, all of them so thin and fluid that not even a single brushstroke can be found anywhere in the work. With all of the records of his origins, Peach's, Peach's composition is completely obscured. As if it had come in complete, intact, a ready-made interactive image slotted into the read-only memory 500 years too soon. Mona Lisa herself sits contrapastal, poised at more than one angle to her audience as if turning toward or away from the view. Her shoulders, head and eyes are centred on subtly different axes, giving her body a sense of movement, animating her eyes and her smile, allowing her gaze to be everywhere and the painting itself to work. Her instincts of conquest are ferocity or the hereditary of the, hereditary of the species, the will to seduce and to ensnare, the charm of deceit, the kindness that consoles, conceals a cruel purpose. All this had disappeared by turns behind the laughing veil. Like Freud's weaving women, Leonardo's works were neither uh, discoveries nor inventions. Scholars have pointed out the sentence we may think his own is actually a transcription from Pliny or Aesop that a certain discovery is in fact the work of Peckham or Al Alazan or what an invention was well known to his contemporaries. All that, sorry. Transcription was one of his favourite pastimes, often copying out word for word long passages from uh, books that interested him. And, and his paintings were mostly widely copied as well. Version of Saint Anne was much copied in toto and in detail. The authors of the copy are often uh, difficult to identify, and the many versions of the Madonna of a yarn winder. None of these them seem to be by Leonardo's own hand. Some scholars believe that they're copies of a lost work, but as Chastel points out, they've never been original. There's never been the original. It is not the painting's meaning, its symbolic value, or even its perfection that makes it work. Leonardo considered it flawed and incomplete, and it certainly is not for his originality. That Leonardo is often praised. Like Freud's weaving woman, women, he is often denigrated for what's dismissed as his tendency to copy material rather than produce originals, uh, whatever they are supposed to be. But the unfinished quality of the work is for a start why it survived. Had he thought it perfect, the painting would have been sold and lost to his estate. Perhaps it is also this which leaves the painting so alive in the making of this day. And if Leonardo is so often copying an existing machine when he worked, the dimensionality, clarity and precision of his diagrams, the usual attention he pays to detail were in themselves major innovations. There have been virtually no technical, better technical drawings until the coming of computer-assisted draftsmanship. Molly, like the girl, is sinless, her birth unregistered, yet around her names, names swarm galaxies of supposition, rumour, conflict and data, street girl, prostitute, bodyguard, Assassin, she mingles on the manif manifold planes of the shadows of heroes and villains whose names mean nothing to angle, though their residual images are long since woven into the global culture, through the global culture. William Gibson, Mona Lisa Overdrive. Uh, Leonardo worked at a time before modernity had divided procedures into science and arts, means and ends, in individ individuated creativity and expertise, isolated media and areas of specialised knowledge and expertise. These are the barriers which the new synthesizers and collaborations spawned by digital through machines now undermine. The artist and the scientist reconnect with the masters of precision and engineering which demands a symbiotic connectivity 
with which we won't consider the tools of the trains and nothing about them. Multidisciplinary research, like multimedia, is only the beginning of a process which engineers the end of both the disciplines and the meditations with which modernity has kept exploratory experiments into wraps. People, thoughts, passages, means of communication, and art forms. The fusion of club culture and networks of dance music production are probably the best example of these interconnections and the explorations which emerge from them. DJs, dancers, samples, machines, keyboards. Precise details of engineering sound, light air, colours, neurochemistries. Not that it is possible to see what's going on, but that's hardly the prime concern. Not what, not what it looks like, but how it works. So... That was an extract from Zeros and Ones, gives you a kind of idea. Um, probably actually wasn't the best chapters we've chosen there, because it was primarily looking at a man's work, and then contrasting it to like ideas of femininity and, um, I guess, the male gaze. But it kind of works. I mean, like this this is a feminist text, um, uh, but it, obviously it kind of deals with all those... Um, ideas of feminism from the male gaze to uh, women's place in history that's been kind of uncovered. It's a very interesting book, as you can probably tell from a lot of it, you can't, it's, there's a lot of uh, contrast to other cultural figures, other um, figures of culture who um, have, who are related to the technical innovators and the women in the work. It kind of explores um, technology and f the female um, sphere and from like top level to down to the kind of interesting stories and anecdotes it explores as well a lot of ideas that kind of is very uh, critical of Freud who kind of is very much seen I guess as the one a very large figure in terms of like psychology and categorization I suppose Freud wanted to just very much simplify a lot of things I suppose in some respects but that's really too complicated an issue to get into in this video um, it's a really good read. I really enjoyed it. Um, I've never really read anything like it before that explicitly explores the relationship between women and the development of computer science programming, etc. Et There's a lot of really good stuff in here about Ada Lovelace, goes and tracks her history. There's a lot of um, good stuff in general about women programmers, um, just on how I suppose women have contributed in a somewhat different way sometimes, or in a kind of like, a, like as I said, like in a hidden way. Uh, it touches on yeah, culture in the broader sense, science, and it's just an interesting read, I'd say. Uh, the scope of it, I think, is actually a strength, because it's, it keeps you engaged, because there's a lot to read, and uh, yeah, I'd fully recommend it, and uh, it's, 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 you have to read it, if you're really, to be honest. Uh, and especially pertinent now, given the Google memo thing that happened recently, which... Uh, I mean, I think, to be honest with that, I'm just going to go on to the same point that I, I think that Google shouldn't have fired the guy. I think he, they were a bit harsh doing that, but it is something that needs to be discussed in the computer science community, I think, and figuring out ways that, you know, women can get back involved in computer science and STEM and stuff, I suppose, or cannot feel that there's barriers to access, I suppose. It's even more important, kind of, historically to read this book now. It wasn't written that long ago. It was early 2000s, I think, so... Yeah, I'd recommend this thoroughly to anybody concerned with the issues of uh, gender, feminism, and technology, how those three things relate, and culture as well. So, yeah, check it out.